on Friday, Jesus was praying, Peter was sleeping, Judas was betraying, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, Pilate was struggling, the council was conspiring, the crowd was vilifying, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. On Friday, the disciples were running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary was crying, Peter was denying, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. On Friday, the Romans beat Jesus. They robed him in scarlet. They crowned him with thorns, but they didn't know that Sunday was coming. On Friday, Jesus walked to Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit burdened. But you see, it was only Friday. Sunday was coming. On Friday, the world was winning, the people were sinning, and evil was grinning. On Friday, the soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised them up next to criminals on Friday. But let me tell you, Sunday was coming. On Friday, the disciples were questioning what had happened to their king and the Pharisees were celebrating and their scheming had been achieved, but they did not know that it was only Friday and Sunday was coming. On Friday, he was hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by the Father, left alone and dying, could nobody save him. It was Friday, but Sunday was coming. On Friday, the earth trembled, the sky grew dark, and my king yielded his spirit. On Friday, hope was lost, death had won, sin had conquered, and Satan was just laughing. On Friday, Jesus was buried, a soldier stood guard, and a rock was rolled into place. But it was only Friday, it was only Friday, and Sunday was coming. our joy to welcome you here as we celebrate Jesus' resurrection, the event that changed eternity for those of us who are in Christ. Let's stand and read this call to worship based on 1 Peter chapter 1 responsively. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has given us new life and hope. He has raised Jesus from the dead. God has claimed us as his own. 
He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
pray. Heavenly Father, we are here today because more than 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ resurrected from the cross and changed the history of the world forever. Lord, we are here today because we get to remember and celebrate that nothing defeated Jesus and he defeated everything. Lord, we are here today because the resurrection gives us hope. It points us to the future that will be completely different to what we experience today. Lord, today we embrace the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because in his resurrection, not only he started to do something in this creation like never before, but in that resurrection, we can trust that you're going to continue to do everything new here in this creation. I pray, Lord, that as we celebrate today as believers, our hope may be in the reality of what Jesus already accomplished and what Jesus is going to do when he returns. Could you please make us people of the resurrection? Could you please speak to us and transform us by the power of your spirit? Could you please, be, could you please God, make us people of hope? And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus, and we all say? Continue our worship.
All right, good morning, familia. Isn't today a beautiful Sunday for us to worship together? Yeah, how about if we give him glory? For those of you who don't know me, my name is Hannibal Rodriguez, and I want to welcome you all, whether you are worshiping with us in person or you're worshiping with us online, you chose an amazing Sunday to worship together as a family of Jesus. And today I want to start by asking you one question. Have you ever experienced anything in your life that is so good, so powerful, so amazing that the only thing you can say is, this is too good to be true? Have you ever experienced anything like that? Like I have. You know, those times I've never forgotten because to a certain degree, those moments had changed me forever. And from that point on, I've never been the same. Those are those moments in which you say, this is too good to be true. One of those, for me, was when I got married. You know, I remember seeing this beautiful 23-year-old girl walking toward me, and and I'm feeling within myself this thing that says, this is too good to be true. You know, that celebration got even better when I saw in my wife's expression a feeling similar to mine. But the other way around, she's looking at me and she's saying, is all of that for me? (laughs) She did not say that. (laughs) I think that for most people that have gotten married, you know, at least at the beginning, this was the experience, you know. Was this really good? Was this really so good that it's so good to be true? See, I've, I've uh, performed and officiated many weddings, and I'm, I'm yet to find a couple in which they see each other at that moment, and they go, I've never seen that. <laughs> That's because it's one of those moments that it's just too good to be true, you know? It was the same thing for me when I, when I got my daughters. You know, it, they're coming out of, you know, there with... <laughs> with all the stuff on, on top, and yet I remember, like it was a high, hyper-spiritual moment in which I see these beautiful girls, and it's like, this is too good to be true. How about if I tell you that something similar to that was what, Je- what the disciples experienced when they saw Jesus resurrected? How about if I tell you that that expression that I just shared with you is precisely the way that we could describe what the disciples experienced when they saw Jesus resurrected. See, in Luke chapter 24, he appears to the disciples, and many of them thought that he was a ghost, but then Jesus shows them his hands and his feet to prove them that it was him and that he was not a ghost. And Luke chapter 24, verse 41 says this, they still did not believe it, believe it because of joy and amazement. So I hope you can see that there's something weird happening there in which the disciples are looking at Jesus and they're thinking, wait, wait, is this true? You see the combination of the phrase, oh, don't believe, joy and amazement. The best way I can translate that is the expression, this is way too good to be true. And today, with the time that I have left, I want to give you five reasons why the resurrection of Jesus Christ, based on Luke chapter 24, is too good to be true. And yet it is. Five reasons. So I need you to do me a favor. Could you look at the person next to you and ask the question, do you really understand what the resurrection means? Go ahead. Let me give you the first one. If Jesus resurrected, then that means that our debt was paid in full. 
We get that from Luke chapter 24, verse 36, in which he says that, well, they were still talking about this, talking about the resurrection, death of, uh, death of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. This is the first thing Jesus says to the disciples the first time he sees them, the first time they're going to see him in person after, after the cross. Peace be with you. In that context and in that time, people will greet like that all the time. That was part of the culture. But Jesus here is not using the typical greeting. He is being intentional about using the word peace, shalom. The question is why? All scholars agree in saying that the reason why Jesus greets his disciples with the word peace is because he's making clear to the disciples that when he went to the cross and he died in our place and he died for our sins and then he resurrected, it was an evidence that the Father had accepted his sacrifice as sufficient, paid in full. This is part of the reason why Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says that Jesus was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. You know what justification means? That if we have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, we are in him and his righteousness is imputed to us. He takes what we deserve, he gives us what he deserves, paid in full. Now, if you don't understand that just yet, let me break it down for you. That because of the resurrection, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ... Your debt is paid in full, meaning that nothing, can you say nothing? nothing? Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Because the debt has been paid in full. Because your debt has been paid in full means that you, have, you don't have to do anything to earn God's salvation. Jesus purchased that salvation for you. It's paid in full. Because the debt is paid in full... There is no condemnation. If you are a believer, if you have believed and repented, you don't need to earn the approval of God. You have been approved by God already. Did you know that part of the reason why we repent is not because we're trying to earn anything from God, but because we already have God. Because your debt has been paid in full. There's no need for you to allow shame or guilt to control your life. Paid in full. The resurrection is way too good to be true, and yet it is. Number two, if, the re if Jesus resurrected, that means that your future is much better than whatever you have before. Luke chapter 24, verse 36 says that while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. No, I love that verse because it doesn't tell you how is it that Jesus made it into that room, you know? The verse doesn't tell you that he came and knocked on the door and he says, could you please let me in? The verse doesn't tell you that he walked through the people to be right in the middle of the conversation. No, scholars agree in saying that Jesus just appeared. Apparently, what happened here is that Jesus, the, the post-resurrection Jesus, was much better than pre-resurrection Jesus. Apparently, he had some abilities that he did not have before in human form. And what the Bible is going to tell us, that that will be our experience just as well, and just as much, that if Jesus resurrected and we have placed our faith in him, our future version will be much better than the current version. So if you think that you're good looking, you got to wait to how you're going to look in the future. <laughs> if you think that you're right, right now, you're good, you got to wait to how you're going to look in the future. And if you're struggling, don't worry, just wait to how you're going to look in the future. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter, 40, 15, chapter 15, verse 43, that we will be raised in glory. Listen, I, I don't know about you, but I'm 46, and I feel that I'm falling apart. Are you guys falling apart? 
you know, I'm trying to eat better. I'm trying to go to the gym more often. I'm trying to slow down the decaying process of being a human being. And yet, since I started going to the gym more often, I'm feeling pain in areas that I did not, have exi- that I did not know existed. Because <laughs> that's part of what it means to be a human being. And yet, the Bible tells us that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, our bodies will be fully glorified and our inner being will be completely transformed. Just picture that day in which you and I will not struggle with fear or anxiety or worry or sickness or shame or guilt or sin. I can't wait for that day. Sometimes to live in this world is just exhausting. And the resurrection is changing all of that. There's more than that, though. Because if you have lost a loved one, you know that one day you're going to see them again. And whatever you remember of them will be nothing compared to how they're going to look like in the future. Can you see that the resurrection is too good to be true? Everything will be much better than before. Can you see why we have to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Number three, if the resurrection, if Jesus resurrected, that means that matter matters. Luke chapter 24, verse 39 says, Look at my hands and my feet. It is is I myself. Touch me and see. And then in verse 41 says that Jesus asked them something really interesting and weird. Do you have anything to eat? So what's happening here is that Jesus is trying to make it super clear that his resurrection was not just a spiritual resurrection, but a physical resurrection. And if that is true, that means that when we resurrect, we not only we're not going to be like ghosts floating in heaven. It means that we, our bodies would also be resurrected. And we, we are going to be able to see and touch and eat. Everything here. Everything is going to be so much better. Everything is going to be so much more amazing, powerful. Everything is going to be uh, Something that we don't know, we can't even imagine just yet. I, I, I want to help you process that, though. Picture the best sunset that you have ever seen. Just for a second, I- imagine the Grand Canyon with all its beauty and magnificence. Just for a second, imagine the best of view you have ever seen. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ tells you that not only we are going to experience extreme consolation, but we're going to get to see the restoration of all things. Listen up, church. The most beautiful things here cannot cannot even be compared to what is yet to come. We can't even see it because we've never been in that place just yet. You know, a few years ago, our younger generation created an expression that I've used before is the expression FOMO, the fear of missing out. And that expression was used to say, well, we got to do everything in our our power to live life right now because of the fear of missing out. But if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, in in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and in the restoration of all things... Did you know that we're not going to miss anything out? That when we are in face-to-face with Jesus, we're going to be like a little kid with a new toy. I don't know if you remember when your kids, you gave them a toy, and they played with the toy for about 10 seconds, and then you gave them a different toy that was better than the old toy, and out of a sudden, this one is no longer good. This one is just amazing. That's kind of how it is, how it's going to be for us as Christians 
when Jesus returns and he restores all things. Not only are we going to experience extreme consolation, but extreme restoration. Don't live your life like if this is all there is. Why settle for this when the best is yet to come? The resurrection is too good to be true. Matter matters. Number four, if Jesus resurrected, that means that everything else Jesus said must be true. Luke chapter 24, verse 44 says, And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. This is Jesus telling the disciples, remember how I told you that everything in the Old Testament pointed and talked about me. Remember how I told you that even the Old Testament said that I will die and resurrect. Listen, and the logic is super simple. If Jesus died and resurrected, then it, and it happened, if Jesus says that he would die and resurrect and it happened, then that means that everything else Jesus said had to be true. The resurrection is the ultimate evidence that everything that Jesus said about himself, about the Father, about the Holy Spirit, about the world, about the future must be true. Why? Because he resurrected. This is the crazy thing about the resurrection, that even atheists believe and agree that the resurrection was a historical fact. They might not believe in Jesus, but he knows that, but they know that he resurrected. And if that is true, then you and I as Christians get to trust and believe in everything else he said. I want to give you, an ex- I got, I give you a few examples. If you ever read the Gospels, you will find the phrase, I will, many times. It's spoken by Jesus many times. And every time Jesus says, I will, it's a promise. Let me, let me remind you all three of those promises. That if Jesus said that he would die and resurrect, and he did res- die and resurrected, then these promises must be true. He says in John chapter 6, verse 37, whoever comes to me, he will, I will never drive away. You know what that means? That he promised that if you come to him, he will not reject you. He tells you that you don't have to fix yourself. Just come to him and he will not reject you. That's a promise that you must believe. Why? Because Jesus died and resurrected. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That promise says that because Jesus died and resurrected, he says that if you come to him, those of us that are tired already, you will find rest. That's a promise. In Matthew chapter 28, he says, I'll be with you until the end of the world. That's a promise. And he tells you that if you have placed your faith in him, he will never walk away from you. He would always be present. Actually, Luke chapter 24 makes that clear when he talks about the third person of the, of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 24, verse 49 says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed, uh, clothed with power from on high. If Jesus says that he would die and resurrect, and he did, then he also said that you will never be alone, and you will never be alone. The resurrection is too good to be true. It is the ultimate evidence that everything that Jesus says was and is true. And number five, if Jesus resurrected, then that means that suffering has an expiration date. Luke chapter 24, verse 46, he says, he told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus died and resurrected, it was the beginning of him making all things new. The beginning of him gradually destructing all the suffering in this world. This is the reason why Paul in Romans chapter 8 says that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is yet to be revealed. And that one day this creation will be set free. 
And that not only this creation will be set free, but ourselves, we ourselves will be set free. I don't know if you can see it, but the Bible says that one day suffering will cease to exist. No more pain. No more dissolution. No more struggle. No more suffering. Peace be with you. The the resurrection is way too good to be true. And yet it is. You know, some biblical counselors have used this expression to explain why is it that we suffer and we struggle so much. They use the term halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. Make sure you remember those because every time you struggle it has to do with one of those four, four things. We struggle when we're hungry either physically or spiritually. We struggle when we are angry either physically or spiritually. We struggle when we're lonely either physically or spiritually. And we struggle when we're tired either physically or spiritually. But if Jesus resurrected... Jesus says to the hungry, peace be with you. One day you will be fully satisfied. And to the angry, he says, peace be with you. One day I will make all things right. And to the lonely, he says, peace be with you. One day I'll come back and you will never feel lonely alone. You will never feel lonely anymore. And to the tired, he says, Peace be with you. Don't lose hope. One day suffering will cease to exist. The resurrection is way too good to be true. And yet it is. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Beautiful Savior, we are not just doing and remembering something religious today. Today we remember and we celebrate and we embrace that the resurrection changed everything. Would you please help us see it, embrace it, and live in light of it. And we pray for all of this in the name of Jesus. And the church says... Thank you, Peter, and as we celebrate the day of resurrection.
finish our service today, I have a couple of things that I want to share with you that I, I don't want you to forget. All right? Number one, uh, if you are new to Wheaton Bible Church or you're visiting for the first time, uh, listen, we are here to love you and serve you in any way we can. If you want more information about the, char- the church, you can use the QR code that is somewhere in front of you, and someone is going to reach out to you and share with you and answer all your questions. Amen? Number two, um, because we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also believe in the restoration of all things. We also believe that we were saved by grace, created for good works. And that's why, as a church, for the last 17 years, we have been doing something called CareFest. How many of you guys have ever participated in CareFest? All right, so we are going to start uh, signing up people for that. So as you exit the sanctuary, you're going to see a few tables there. Our team is there. They have T-shirts for you. All you have to do is sign up. I'm so looking forward to see how the Lord is going to use us as we celebrate CareFest together. And lastly, I'm super, super excited to announce. I'm super excited because it was my idea. That's basically why, right? (laughs) Um, I'm super excited to announce that we, uh, in May 1st, on May 1st, we're going to start a new series based on the Gospel of Matthew. Listen up, church. That series is going to take us about a year and a half. And part of the reason why we want to go through the Gospel of Matthew is because as a church, we have always believed in inerrancy of the Scripture and sufficiency of the Scripture. Therefore, we want to walk through the Gospel of Matthew, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, allowing the Bible to speak to us however the Bible wants to speak to us based on the Gospel of Matthew. Amen? Amen. But what is super cool about this, though, is that we have created these journals for you to have. And in, in every single one of these, the, the thing is that you're going to make it last for a year and a half. Um, so good luck on that one. But so, so the way we're going to do this is you're going to find here the sections we're going to be reading and studying together. And there's a section for you to take notes. So I want to invite you to get one of these when, uh, when they're available. I think it's next week. And I, I, uh, there's, a, there's a small donation if you want to. It's $5. You could get one for you, for your family members. Or maybe you could use this to give it to somebody else. Now... If there's someone that doesn't have the $5, do not worry. The Lord provides, just grab one of these. Is that good? Amen? Amen. All right. How about we receive the blessing that Jesus Christ guarantees for us at the cross? And today I'm going to ask you to do something. Could you please stretch out your hands like this? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the church says, we love you. Thanks for coming. Church, you are sent.